Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke Chat. My name is Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts. And tonight, um, we've never had a bad guest. We've never had a guest I haven't felt honored to chat with. But I never enjoy our evenings more than the host's chat because I'm with my instructors and I'm with the people who, if all other martial arts disappeared in the world, these are the people I'm, I'm going to be following and, and learning from. And uh, so we know that doesn't negate anything else, but I love what we get into on these nights. So I'm super excited for our conversation tonight. And I'm so happy that you're all here watching to join us. We were just talking before we started rolling uh, the camera. And what Sensei was saying is that, you know, you can watch this uh, on YouTube live right now. You can be listening to this later uh, on a podcast on any of the podcast platforms. Um, and there might come a day where we don't record this with a live audience, so to speak, on the Zoom chat. And that's why we love our host chat too, because as we get into the questions, and I'll talk more about this later, you could be featured on the show. And it'd be a shame if uh, one day we close the doors on that because we grew the show or, or we just decided to do it that way. So we're really happy you're here tonight. Um, it's my pleasure every week to introduce Sensei Nicolas Suino. And I'm going to keep it real simple this week because I want to get into our conversation. He's somebody I looked up to, I've looked up to for over 20 years and who I'm lucky enough to consider a friend. He's an eighth Dan in Iaido, a sixth Dan in Jiu Jitsu, a sixth Dan in Judo. And I just want to ask you straight up, Sensei, it's been way too long since I've seen you. How are you tonight? Doing great. Thank you. It's great to see you. And these are my people here. Mm. It's great to see you guys. Um, too much virtual in, in our lives together and uh, not enough personal. Uh, all is good, Sean. I've been watching your adventures, which has been fun. I know we're going to talk about at least one of those, which will be fun. Uh, but it's fall, which means a ton of training, back to school training. Had a lot of training both inside and outside of JMAC and ready to keep it going. Keep the trend going. Yeah. Falls to me. Every time we do this show to introduce Sensei Randy Dauphin, and I think everybody on this call knows Randy pretty well. What you may not know is that I helped get him addicted to Roos Roast Coffee, which is a little boutique <laughs> coffee shop in Ann Arbor, Michigan, started by my boy Johnny Roos, who used to be a Subaru salesman. He always had the dream of making his own brand of coffee and eventually became really good at it and now is featured in Trader Joe's and and Whole Foods and all kinds of great places. And um, he spends his summers in Maine now on an island making coffee for the locals and catching lobsters. And uh, he posted a picture a week or so ago of uh, him with a, with a cup of Ruth Rose coffee and Martha Stewart sitting next to him. So he's in the big time now. Yeah. So Randy, your, your favorite coffee from Ann Arbor, Michigan now has become, has become mainstream and international celebrity coffee. <laughs> what do you think of that? I love that guy, man. And I love that coffee too. Like, uh, I was just saying that, to, I can't remember who I said it to. It was me. It was me. It was, was it you, Sensei? Yeah. Yeah. I said, uh, when I go to Ann Arbor, the first thing I do is drive to JMAC. And if nobody's there, I drive directly to Ruse Roast yeah. and get a coffee. And then I drive to your house to, to find you there. <laughs> that's, that's my order. I get off the highway. <laughs> Go there, go to J, go to JMAC, go to Ruse Roast, then go back to your house. Uh, I love that place. And he, I sent his coffee actually to the most northern community in the face of the earth. It went all the way up to uh, Alert None of It, where Sydney was, because she wanted some of his coffee. So I shipped it up there. So it's been with Martha Stewart and as far north with Santa Claus. <laughs> Santa. Oh. <laughs> anyway thanks for that interest sensei uh it's uh been way too long um that picture that i posted of you and i and dan and miller popped up in my timeline and i was instantly happy to see it and also super sad that i i just want to be with you guys so bad like if i could be anywhere right now that's where i would be i i miss you guys tremendously and uh, thanks for that intro. And again, I just, every day when I wake up, I check the website to see, is the United States going to let Canadians come in yet? And as soon as they say that we can, I'll be like blasting across the border to find you. I got we'll lots of holiday time. I can't wait to come. Yeah. So for me, every week, I get to introduce Sense of Legacy. 
who is a 10th degree black belt and a member of the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. And he's also an author of this book. And I have since I always put Sensei Suino's, one of Sensei Suino's books here. Sensei Suino has a lot of good books too. This is the one that I reference the most, as you can tell from all the little bookmarks when I'm training. Um, and it's inscribed here. It says, to Randy Dauphin in good health and good training, July 13th, 2003, which I think was about like 15 years after we met each other. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so since the legacy is an author, also a student of Harold Warden, uh, that was his first instructor, student of Benny Allen, who I named my son after Benny Allen. And I always say that the engine in Legacy Shore and Rue came from Benny Allen. The way we mm -hmm. punch and we hit came from that, man. And my biggest regret too, like it's over there. There's a picture of Sense Legacy getting his black belt over there from Benny Allen. And it says, Randy, don't wait until it's too late. And it's because uh, that's my biggest regret is I was alive when Benny Allen was alive and I had that opportunity to meet him and it didn't happen. And if you could turn back the hands of time, I would have bugged Sensei Legacy a lot more to, to meet him. Um, Sensei Legacy is also a student of Richard Kim and is currently a student of Anthony Sandoval. Uh, Anthony Sandoval is the person who graded him to his 10th degree black belt. And Sensei Legacy is also a student of Sensei Suino's, and he got his black belt in the idol from Sensei Suino as well. Um, there's a couple of things. I, well, the thing I want to say about Sensei Legacy is just something from our trip that was kind of funny. So we were all in Sensei McLaren, Nick McLaren's house, who is our BC rep. And on the first night, it's like myself and Christine and Sydney Dauphin down in the very lower level of his house. And then on the next level of his house, Sensei Legacy has the extra bedroom and Sensei Bowron is sleeping on the couch. And then on the next level is Sensei uh, McLaren's room. And the next level is the room where we all hung out, which is on the roof that overlooks the ocean. But on the first day, you know, when you're traveling the first day, everybody's like, oh, what do I do? Where, do, which bathroom do I use? Can I go get a coffee? Can I open the fridge? And so Christine and I found ourselves in the kitchen and Sensei Byron was still sleeping on the couch. And then Sensei Legacy came out of his room and the three of us were standing there. <laughs> then Sensei Byron started to stir because the three of us were talking. And as Sensei Byron looked over, Sensei Legacy over his cup of coffee went, yep, you got the wake up room, he says, right? <laughs> 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 And we just died laughing, right? But anyway, so that was just a funny random moment. Um, I have Sense of Legacy's book and I always introduce it every week, but I just thought I would read a couple of paragraphs here for everybody. Um, and this is on page 78, if you have it, and it's the heading is set up part two. And here's what it, the first two paragraphs. Whether you face many attackers or only one, a fight can be a dire proposition. Who do not let your opponent know how you feel inside. Always maintain a poker face because you never want them to know if you are intimidated by their presence that you are take, or that you are taking them lightly. To help you avoid betraying your feelings, do not look into your opponent's eyes. Keep your eyes on the chest area, around the sternum or chest plate. This will give your eyes the advantage of seeing all the limbs, arms and legs alike. Always see the big picture, just like when driving a car, so that you can react to any movement regardless of whether it comes at you from the front or the periphery. So if you're interested in that, you should get this book and then you should read the rest of it. And you should also reach out to Sense Legacy, who would be happy to teach you some of these things. It'll only take you about 15 to 30 years to be able to figure out all the contents of this mm. book, but you might as well start now. That's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's my introduction for Sense Legacy tonight. Uh, I want to also, because it's a host chat, just say, uh, we don't often talk about Sean Benson. He doesn't often get a huge introduction. And I just want to say 
he's been training. He's almost not a quitter. How long, Sean, before you're not a quitter? Uh, under a year and a half, I'd say. Year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, because it's September, right? It's the beginning of karate season. So it'll be us. it'll be two then. Yeah. So two two till I'm not a quitter. To be yeah, honest, two, 28. Yeah, but that's awesome. That's uh, a really long time. Uh, Sean said his ups and downs, mostly ups, but karate's always maintained a high level and presence in his life. Even when he was at his lowest points, uh, it was something that was inside of him. I'm super proud of him. And one of the things I want to say about Sean is, uh, if you don't know, since the legacy years ago, put me in charge of doing the recommendations for our gradings. And since legacy and I were talking about this while we were on holidays and we said, you know, that Sean Benson's a damn good karate teacher. He's a good karate teacher. The students that he puts in front of me for the recommendations, I don't have any problems. And when I do give Sean some feedback, he implements it right away. And when they go in front of Sensei Legacy, he just often signs the piece of paper and pushes it off to the side. So uh, that's one of the things I want to say about Sean tonight is great martial artist, been in martial arts for a long time. And now is a really good karate teacher is passing that along to other students. And I'm really proud of you, Sean. Thanks, Sensei. That means the world to me. And as we talked about on this show, like sometimes hearing a compliment about my students is as nice or nicer as about me because I kind of know what I can do, but I'm still hoping that they're doing it in a way that is in line with what we're doing. So I, I, that means the world to me. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the attention i like attention so thanks for the intro <laughs> um hachi do you want to say anything else uh, before we get to the the housekeeping at all no except hey. that i do i do uh, see the very good quality in your students thanks and hachi comes from you for sure right on um I'm, I'm not trying to be Sean, before you do the housekeeping sensei why don't you talk about that t-shirt just briefly that you're wearing like and then I'll I'll frame it up later. Love that logo. Yeah. This is uh, Sensei Bill Hines um, Canada Goju Crest. They are the Warriors of Light, <clears throat> and um, it was sent to me by the one of the dojos. Uh, and um, do you want to tell them about maybe the T-shirt? You want me to do that? Oh, yeah. So I guess we, before we do the housekeeping, then one of the things we wanted to talk about is if uh, if your dojo needs a little promo, we're happy to do that on this. And if you have a T-shirt and it's a size large and you want to send it to me or Sensei Suino or uh, Sensei Benson or directly to Sensei Legacy. And if your dojo is good, he'll wear it <laughs> on the show and we'll say a couple of nice words about it. But if you, you'll also know if you send us your t-shirt and your do we don't feel your dojo is fitting. I don't know. We might not do anything with it, but, but anyway, like I hope your dojo is good and we'd like to promo your dojo. So, you know, I like Sensei Legacy's logo. It's almost as, the one he's wearing is almost as good as this one. Right. Like, <laughs> but that's just my opinion. Right. But I do love Sensei Heim. I'm really great organization. Great logo. Awesome. Um, so yeah, just for the housekeeping, if, if anybody watching the show hasn't been part of a host's chat or it's your first night, generally we have a guest and we interview them and uh, you type your questions in. Andre tonight's running the back, the, the behind the scenes uh, and he or Robert or Victoria, whoever's doing it will send it to us. But uh, on the host chat night, we'd like to put our video on you. We'd like you to be a part of the show. And if you have a question for any of us, uh, or just a concept you want us to bandy about in a non-specific way, then we'll throw the camera on you. If you don't want that, please type that in the message. We don't need to force anybody to be on camera, but what a wonderful chance if you'd like to, to be a part of this living history that we're creating. And I just want to say, you know, I love Sensei Dauphin when you introduce Sensei Legacy each week. I really love the little tidbits. And I know we've talked about this behind the scenes, but imagine if you could just get a sense of what Matt's and where his sense of humor was or what Itosu's quips were. Like, it might not be fundamental to the kata, but it is because it's the person who made the stuff we're doing. So I, I just want to, I, I really just appreciate all those. Hanchi, honestly, sometimes I see you kind of going, why is he telling that story? And I'm like, I love when he tells those stories because it, it creates the three dimensions of the person who's literally spearheading an art. So 
I just think that's super cool. Um, aside from looking forward to your questions, this is for adults having a conversation. If there's any content you don't like, if there's any swearing you don't like, we don't need give a sheep. Uh, I, you know, I tried to go Scottish there halfway through. Nick, I'm sorry. That was the worst Scottish I've ever done trying to say we don't give a shit. Um, anyways, I just actually want to throw out a quick hi to you too, Nick. Um, all our guests are valuable, but uh, I, I also got to crash at his house when I was out in Vancouver a couple months ago. And, you know, we've all been lucky enough to have that family. Um, I was thinking we might uh, talk about the GoFundMe as well out of the gate too, right? Just to, to put that on everybody's minds. If we, we want to talk about the GoFundMe, there's a couple of announcements that I guess I could make uh, okay. before. And then if people have questions about it, they can send those in as well. But uh, a former guest on our show and just a former friend of, or a current friend of Sensei Legacies and pioneer in North American martial arts, uh, Sensei Chuck Merriman's been in the hospital since June. And he's, I guess he's not feeling too well. Um, the message that I got is that he's coming out of it, but he has a lot of medical bills and there's a GoFundMe that's been started for him. So we just want to call attention to that. Uh, you can hit any one of us up and we can give you the link to that if you're interested in where that GoFundMe is. And, you know, there's, there's no, there's no maximum amount. If you got, if you're a billionaire and you got a million dollars to give them, please give them a million bucks. And, you know, if you got an extra $2 and you can put $2 on the GoFundMe, go ahead and put the $2 on the GoFundMe. You know, it makes me always think about uh, Bodhi Dharma, the begging monk, right? When the, the poor person dropped two coins in his cup, right? And he praised that person tremendously. And then a rich person came by and put a whole bunch of money in and he just ignored them, right? And the person said, hey, why aren't you thanking me like you thank that poor person? And Bhattadharma said, it's you who should be thanking me. And the point of that is, if you got $2 to give, you're going to feel good that you gave it to somebody who needed it, right? So, so if you can support uh, Sensei Merriman, please uh, support him. Another thing I want to do is, uh, I know Sensei Suino has a more of a relationship with uh, Sensei Nobetsu, but Today is Sensei Nobetsu's 86th birthday. I've trained with him a number of times in his dojo, even in, in Japan. And awesome guy, awesome martial artist. And I think all of us just want to wish him a really happy 86th birthday. Uh, Sensei Suino, you know, anything you want to say about that? Uh, well, you know, a lifetime well spent in martial arts. I think the first time I ever trained with Nobetsu Sensei was uh, like in 1986 or something. Um, and, and, you know, he was a badass then and a cool dude and a hard drinking guy. Um, and now he's 86 and he's a badass and, and uh, a cool dude and a hard drinking, you know, we call him Pancho, but we also call him the honey badger because he just doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> honey badger don't give a fuck <laughs> he is in charge he'll yes. walk in he'll walk into the joint wherever it is and just make himself make his presence known right and everybody jumps to it like you know he's like five foot one and and 86 years old and he's in charge and that's just how it is and what a cool life that he that that guy's lived awesome that's awesome the last announcement, Sean, is, uh, and I think he's on the call, and I'm sorry, I have not met this person before, but it's Sensei Darioshu. Um, and if you know him, he's actually the owner of Satori Uniforms. So uh, they make great belts, great uniforms, and he's having an event soon. Uh, it's called the Yellow Brick House, and it's a fundraiser for women and families that are in distress. And Sensei Legacy and I are going to be going to teach at that. And if you want information at that about that or how to donate to the Yellow Brick House, again, reach out to any one of us and we'll get the information to you so that you can do that. And I think those are the announcements, but I definitely want to talk about Sensei Honey Badger later in this show. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, well, you know, we were chatting a bit about this before, before we started. So I think this would be a great place to start. You know, we're coming back from sort of vacays time away. So I know you two were out in Vancouver together and 
I, I think that's a really good place to start, especially since you bumped into two of our guests out there. Awesome. Yeah. Which one do you want? Sensei well, legacy? What do you, what do you, or what is the question or what do you want well, to know? You, how about you just crack into it and then we'll, we'll, I mean, how was it to, to see Sensei Demura and, and, um, and our Aikido, I mean, legend over there in person? Well, you know, actually, you know, it, it's sort of like being a little kid. When you see somebody like Muhammad Ali or Elvis or whatever, you know, you get a bit starstruck. You just, you're trying to get a hold of his character in such a short time. Mm. And usually I don't say anything. I, I just like to listen. Other people handle stuff and I get to know more about him. He's quite a classy character and a very knowledgeable, knowledgeable person. You know, he's, but, um, you know, he, he's doing a movie right now and, uh, or, um, and he talks about it all day long about martial arts. I mean, all day long and when he, when he's around martial arts students, I think he really enjoyed uh, talking to us about fishing. Mm. Now I'll put that into uh, Randy's hands because he, Randy did most of the talking to him because he, has this way of getting things out of people. So, uh, again, you know, it was nice to see him other than looking at a poster. Yeah. So that was pretty good for me. What about you, Sensei Dofan? You once said to me something which I've never forgotten. And it was probably the first year we were training together that you'd like drive a thousand miles just to shake Muhammad Ali's hand. You wouldn't need anything, even just to be around him. Like you don't even need to shake his hand just to get that greatness. And I remember loving that because you're not going to get some big lesson, but you get to be around the man who's done it all. And, you know, anyways, I just never forgot that. And I thought about you when I saw those photos. Yeah, it's interesting you say that, Sean. Muhammad Ali, like I would fly all the way to the Great Wall of China just to watch him walk past me. And I, even if he never talked to me or recognized me just to say, the champ walked past me one time in my life. And yeah, said to Demora, that's a very interesting thing that you say. He didn't realize, he thought we lived in Vancouver. And I think something changed when we said to him, we're from Ontario. Like kind of some lights went off in his head that, oh, these people are here on their holiday and they wanted to come and see me. And I think he was, he was happy that we would extend that effort to go and see him. And you know, the one thing that I would say that wherever we went, it all got kind of tied together because the sense of Demur is doing the remake of Shogun and he's the technical advisor. So I don't know what that is. I imagine you would know better than anybody, Sean. It's probably like he sits there and then somebody holds a sword and he says, don't hold it like that. Hold Pretty it much. like this. Pretty much. Right? <laughs> you know? Or they come out on set and he says, your Hakama's on backwards to the back, that plate is <laughs> yeah. on the back. Yeah. yeah. Sensei Legacy is now because of the Bruce Lee movie where the guy was fighting Bruce Lee with his Hakama on backwards. You can go watch all, you can go watch all the Bruce Lee movies to find that. Um, but uh, because of that movie, when we were talking to Sensei Mustard and we were having dinner, his wife runs a Japanese antique shop. Oh, wow. And she was like, oh, the remake of Shogun everybody's come in and they've bought all of these kimonos from me. I have no kimonos left. And when we went to Makaido, where we buy our hakamas from, uh, Nancy, the lady who runs Makaido said, oh, I need to buy a hakama for one of the students here. And she said, only those four are left because they're apparently they're doing a movie and they mm. came in and bought 130 hakamas from us. So I know, wow. right? That's great. But Sese Demora was super gracious we actually had to dismiss ourselves. I think we would still be there talking to him because mm. he just kept, he was showing us pictures from movies. We actually saw a picture of him fighting a tiger, like literally standing there doing a high block with a Bengal tiger on top of him from a movie. And when we asked him questions about, so was the tiger trained well? And he was like, not so well. Ah. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but I agree with Sensei Legacy. The main thing he liked to talk about was fishing. He likes to fish. Um, 
And if you think about Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid and Miyagi liking to fish and that, you can see that link of, uh, I showed him a couple of pictures on my phone. Sensei Legacy says, I have a way of getting things. I showed him a couple of pictures. I showed him a Oops. Is that, is that me or is that Sensei? Yeah, that's it for all of us. He's stuck for the moment. Sensei, if you can hear us, you're, uh, you might be a little bit frozen over there. Well, um, <laughs> maybe he can hear us. Let's <laughs> let's let's throw it back to you, Sensei Legacy, because uh, you obviously you, you met Sensei Mustard out there as well. Yeah, uh, there's a guy who's a, a gracious guy. You know, you always expect to be a martial artist a certain way, and what ran in my mind when I met him was he's just a ground level, ordinary guy who can throw you all over the damn place. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it, the guy doesn't have to be um, a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, a gym teacher or anything. Martial arts come from all walks of life, yeah. you know, and, and a lot of it, I suppose, that we learned, like from all the uh, Okinawan weaponry, we're just farmers. Yeah. Right. So it was really nice. You can tell he's knowledgeable. He believes in his art. And there's no pretentious feelings from him ever. Just a nice guy who likes to talk and have a good time, have a couple of beers. That's great. Yeah. Did you do any? Did you do any hands-on training with him? <laughs> I'm 75 years old. I'm not going <laughs> to let him touch me. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Uh, <laughs> so let's say sweeter do you have a timeline in mind for when you won't do the big flying falls uh well i'm doing fewer and fewer of them you know the beauty of jmac is we have a sprung floor so yeah i'll do them there but i'm not doing flying falls anywhere else anymore unless you know to save my life but yeah right. definitely too too much pain every day i don't need to add to it at a rapid rate hey hanshi um um the whole you know we talked for months about having a beer with robert mustard so you guys had a beer with him, and I, I think I think the conversation was beer and chicken wings. But what did you end up actually doing with him? Yeah, we uh, we met at Nick's, and he brought me some Rickards Red, mm -hmm, which you like. I had a hard time finding it. Mm -hmm. oh, you, you people need to get your acts together out there. <laughs> and he brought me a case, and uh, he brought me that as a president, and um, I could tell he had a bit of a hard time giving it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. It's, I brought you this. Do you really want it? Ah. Um, he is a great fun guy. And, and you know that if you're going to intimidate him, you have to expect the worst. Yeah, I suspect so. What a cool dude. Yeah. He's big, too. He's not a small guy. He's really? Big. I'm a bit of a small person around everybody else. Like, I'm five foot seven. He's probably... Yeah, you know, that. you know what I was surprised about when we interviewed Bill Hines, he looked very small on camera when he when we talked to him. But he's not a small he's not a small man at all. When I saw photos of him standing next to other people, actually a pretty big human being, right? Actually, I can't remember. <laughs> oh, really? I can't remember how he was compared to myself. Mm -hmm. Probably a bit bigger than I was when he was younger. He was barrel chested. Like yeah, that. that's probably what I yeah. what I saw. You know what's funny, Hunchy? I don't know if you do this too, but I'm terrible at estimating people's size when they're on the mat. I don't know what it is about training with people. I sort of in my mind reduce them all to the same same size, and I'm always, I'm often surprised. I'll step off the mat with somebody I train with, and I go, "Holy crap, you're really big." Uh. <laughs> I don't feel it the same way on the mat for some reason. Uh. I, I, on the other hand, I always uh, check out whether he's left or right-handed right away. And I guess that shows itself. Mm -hmm. Also the size because of how fast I can move, mm -hmm. how fast he can move. So I, I do sort of try to estimate their size and how they can move. I wonder if there's a difference between the way somebody who mostly strikes and somebody who mostly grapples, you know, views the world. Um, you know, so much of what I do is kinesthetic. You know, I train judo without looking or grappling without looking. And that's a 
that's a weakness for me in striking because I'm so used to just kind of, you know, <laughs> just doing something without looking because huh. it's all here, right? It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a different sense. Mm-hmm. I'm imagining and you're feeling. That's what it feels like. Yeah, it's different. You back, Randy? I'm back, Sensei. All right, welcome. Hey. You're on Please. the other side of the room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I joined the club of Sean Benson crashed once. Uh, yep. The champ Vanderbilt crashed like 37 times on the show. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice. <laughs> so I don't know where, where is it that you go? Is it all, they all go to the same place when that yeah. happens? It's just like a white room with like, no, like just, you just, you know, you're, are, they, are you crossing over or aren't you in that moment? Um, sensei, we were talking about uh, Sensei Mustard. We, we, we went in that direction. And how was your experience chatting with him or hanging with him? Did you get any hands on? I love the guy personally. Like he's just a, uh, the one thing I would say about him is I heard what Sensei Legacy said about him being very capable. But the other thing is he's very genuine. He's a very honest person. He doesn't try and misrepresent himself. Mm. Right. Like he's just, he is who he is. And I personally like that. Um, I've exchanged a number of text messages since then. And uh, he said something that Sensei McLaren had said, where he was kind of bashful about it. We were having a lunch with him. And uh, Sensei McLaren said he thinks he's the most dangerous man in Vancouver. And Sensei Mustard doesn't think that he is. But... uh, I agree with Sensei McLaren. He's just, I don't think he's a type of person, like it doesn't take long sitting across from a table with a person to know, like this is not a person that you want to like press unless you're willing to go to that place. Mm -hmm. And he's definitely willing to go there with you. If you want to go, he's going to go there with you. Um, (laughs) Yeah. But really great guy. I don't think there's anybody. If you, if you sit down with Sensei Mustard and you don't like him, you should check yourself and figure out what's wrong with you because he's a likable person, an honest person, a good person to be around. And I hope I get to see him again soon. Um, I, I definitely want to pivot this to Sensei Suino, but a great question just came up for me. Um, is, it, is there a point at which you can be too humble? Like at what point do you have to know how good you are? Or at what point can, is the self-effacing maybe a weapon where you're like, no, nah, I'm not really that tough. Where, where does that fit, Hanchi? Well, I think in your training, it's just going to come out. There's, it's already set in your, mm. in your being that you're only going to push me or I'm only going to be humble so far. And then you start being feeling degraded. And I think as a martial artist, that's where it stops. Right. For me anyway. You know, I've been humble. I've, uh, well, I've tried. Uh, you know, I had some young guy one time want to fight me over a parking spot. You know, and I, I just said, uh, "What are you going to do? Beat me up and go and tell all your friends you beat up a seventy-five-year-old guy?" You know, so tried to embarrass him a little bit, but it would have been a different story had he touched me. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> a very different story. <laughs> Uh, I think as a martial artist, you're aware of being humble, uh, but you're also aware of danger and it will override you. It will override you where you become endangered. Yeah. To defend yourself. If your sensei has trained you properly. What do you think, Sensei Dolphin? And then we'll throw it to Sensei Suino and ask about his time. I'm going to answer, Sean, but uh, Sensei Copeland just sent a message and his name came up uh, with Sensei Mustard because Sensei Legacy or I said something about Sensei Copeland. We were talking about Windsor and Sensei Mustard said, I go to Windsor all the time to an Aikido dojo. And he said, oh, yeah, I was there when Sensei Copeland got his show done in Aikido. And Sensei Copeland just put a message and said, uh, Sensei Suino is really, or Sensei Mustard is really good. He's thrown me a number of times, like, and I agree, he's a badass. So uh, just want to throw Sensei Copeland's note into this chat. Um, yeah, it's coming uh, from a tough guy. 
Coming yeah. from a tough guy, yeah. Yeah, respect him there. I don't know, Shauna. I like to be, I, I like to just be me. Yep. Right. Um, if I'm just being honest about myself, I don't like the feeling of somebody's finger on my chest. Um, so I just don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable and it makes me want to remove their finger off of my chest. Mm -hmm. So if you don't put your finger on my chest, I'm probably going to be a super nice guy. Uh, you know, I'll say what Sensei Legacy says. If you work in a cookie factory all day, you don't go home and eat cookies, right? So like, I'm in here all the time, fighting all the time. I don't really want to fight, but I don't want anybody to push me around and I don't want to feel that way. So, I mean, I don't know. Sensei Suino said once when we were in Japan, he said, see that kid doing judo? He reminds me of you. He has total disdain for everybody. <laughs> Um, you know, he's totally capable of blah. So I don't know, maybe as I get older, I'm going to be less, um, more humble. Uh, I will say on the humility thing, I don't think I'm doing anything that anybody else can't do. Everybody else can do what I can do. Mm. They just need proper training and devote themselves to it. Love that. Sensei Sweeno, can you be too humble? And then how's your time been? <laughs> well, well, to add to what Randy says, you know, I think Randy and I think each of you, as I know you guys well enough to say, you all have a very clear perspective about where you are in the, mm. in the world of martial arts, right? Um, everybody uh, on the top line of this call has a right to be very, very proud of where they are, right? And no false humility is needed, but real humility, real humility is needed, <laughs> right? Um, and so I, I, you know, I have a, I have a, a long time friend who used to be a newscaster and he met a lot of famous people. You guys have probably heard the name Heidi Ochii, right? A pretty famous karate guy. And he interviewed Heidi Ochii and once and, and afterwards I was talking to this guy, Kevin, and he said, you know, that guy didn't have a trace of false humility. He was very confident, but he said, you know what? He was also not arrogant. He knew, you know, and this is one of them for his day, Heidi Ochii was one of the most famous martial artists, right? In, in North America, uh, in the Western hemisphere. And, uh, and, and I like that he was, he was very confident, but not ridiculously con confident. So yeah, I don't know, you can, you can definitely be too humble. There is a part of the martial arts world where people walk around with their heads down and um, are obsequious. That's my big word of the day. It's my last big word of the day. And um, I think that false humility, and I think humility worn as a, as a, as a, um, garment if you forgive the expression is probably a mistake and i i don't think it helps anybody i love that sensei sweden sorry to chip in before we get to your, your time but you know humility is being right-sized in my world that's a, that's a phrase we use in sobriety and and i think that false humility is a manifestation of ego uh when you're right and i mean we're always a little above or below where we're actually at and the goal i think is to be where we're at um but I love that idea of wearing your humility as a garment. I'm going to steal that because I really do think that people who think they're worse than they are, they're also living in an egoic state. But I don't buy it either. I don't buy it. I don't think they really think they're, I think there are people with self-image problems. Fair enough. But I think most of the time false humility isn't humility at all. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's, I think Amen. it's, uh, I think it's uh, uh, falseness. I think they're putting on a, a show for the people around them to make the people around them think something about them that's not true. Yep. Hmm. Yep. It's funny you say that because, uh, you know, I know that in, and I don't want to make this about anything to do with my acting, but there's a lot of actors who pretend they don't want to be famous. Like I want to be rich, famous on the magazine covers. And if I fall short of that, by the time I'm dead, I mean, I have been, and I have a good life. So <laughs> if I don't get the 20 mil a picture that I want, I'll be willing to fail at that before I'll pretend I don't want it. And that's something I think a lot of people do. They'll be like, I don't really want that. And it's like, are you sure you're just not worried you might not be able to do it? I'm worried I might not be able to do it. It's what drives me to get up and write my scripts and stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm not a fan of false humility either at all. Well, that was my opinion on it. It's stupid. Appreciate it. <laughs> I really appreciate it. So tell us what you've been up to. Tell us about your vacay. Man, I've been... Uh... Uh, you know, it's fall and we talk about the outdoor activities that I do. And that's not what this show's about, but I've been spending a lot of time up north prepping for 
a lot of outdoor stuff that's going to happen over the next few months. So that's been, that's been super fun. Um, martial arts related. I had a group of folks from Pennsylvania come out and uh, uh, study some Eido with us. And Hanchi's showing us his t-shirt again. <laughs> um, but what's, what's been wonderful and a big theme of this show is generations, right? We've got teachers and their students and their students then to take on students. We already talked about that somewhat tonight. Um, uh, and, and these guys are firmly in the JMAC camp. They're kind of a satellite dojo of JMAC now. And I'm teaching their senior guys who are teaching the, everybody else in their dojo. Very similar to what's happened in, in the legacy tradition for, for decades now. It's just really rewarding to see your efforts multiply. Gotcha. Who's great? Um, what, what are they? What are they? Who came since it's your dojo? Because they uh, came. To yeah, last time they brought up quite a number of people. This time, just the two top guys, Bob Wolf and Alan, Alan Starner, came. So we were able to really dig in, uh, do a lot of technical work on their stuff, and give them some more techniques. Um, we trained over uh, over two days. We probably trained eight and a half, nine hours, something like that. It was good. Yeah, they should be. Uh, they should be really happy because I had, in fact, invited you to come on vacation with Sensei Legacy and I, and you said I can't because I have these people coming. Mm. So they should be really pleased because <laughs> my preference would have been that you would have been with Sensei Legacy and I out in Vancouver. Um, Although I feel that I might have been in a different bedroom had you shown up. Like, I... <laughs> well, I, it would have been great to see you guys, but it would have been really great to see Sydney. So, <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I would have loved to have been out there and we'll make that happen one of these years. Yeah, I went through my photos and I have more pictures of Sense of Legacy in Sydney than anything else on my. I have pictures of them sitting on the couch. I have pictures of them eating dinner together. I have pictures of them training together. Yeah. Sydney and Sense of Legacy had a lot of photo ops while we were away. Well, you can go to your grave knowing that you were very successful in at least one thing. And that is that she is one of the most wonderful human beings I know. So that's cool. It's got to be cool for you. Absolutely, yes. It was um, interesting when Sensei Mustard came for dinner... We were all eating and then Sydney was just quietly clearing plates and washing dishes and bringing more food and just being the total like just quiet second Dan who is and at one point uh, Sensei Mustard said to her you can just call me Rob, Rob. and she said uh, I'm sorry you'll forever be Sensei to me and then she took his plate <laughs> and went to the kitchen. <laughs> I love that. Sorry, Ben. I, I stepped on you. What were you going to say? Oh, no, that's great. I was actually going to, if, if we want, throw it to one of our questions. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Well, Alden Adair, I know I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to make it to the show tonight, but he's got a question. I'm really excited to hear the answer from the teachers as well. We've touched on some of it ages ago, but um, if we can throw the camera on Alden for his question, uh, Alden's also a uh, second degree black belt and uh, runs the Toronto club with me. He's my top student. And, uh, you know, I, I talk about the Toronto Club a little bit, but if you're ever down here, look us up. And uh, I always promote Alden because there'd be no club without him. So, Alden, how are you, brother? It's nice to see you. There we are. Hey, hey. Hey. Okay. hey, Alden. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Get my tripod out. I'm good. How are you? Welcome back, Sensei. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, my question was, uh, uh, physical fitness and uh, it's almost like a three-part question how important is it for the martial arts particularly strength that's that's kind of the, the maybe the focus of like extracurricular uh, physical exercise and and strength is a focus on that how does that like uh, interact with martial arts do you does it does everyone do it how do they do it uh and how is that different for specifically Sensei Simino for judo? And then Hanchi also, was that ever a part of kind of the early days of karate in Canada? Were, were people doing a lot of weights then? Was it was was that a focus on anything? Were they doing more cardio? Or is it just all training in the dojo? 
Well, if you're asking me, karate is an exercise. And usually nowadays you're facing like the MMA, they're facing other top quality martial artists. So every advantage you can have in that case is necessary. But um, as far as self-defense goes, uh, if you take um, Sydney Dauphin, she can knock you out in a second, but I'm sure she doesn't do a lot of weightlifting while she does a lot of stretching and other things. If right. you understand the, the formulas in martial arts where you need uh, to accelerate to give you that power as opposed to have strength. Just think of a bullet, you know, a bullet's the size of the end of your finger. And when it hits a 250 pound man, 200 yards away, it'll knock him right off his feet. He doesn't, it doesn't need to be heavy. It just needs to be fast. So um, I would talk like Randy trains like crazy all the time. And that's to make him a really, really unique martial artist. Mm -hmm. But I myself, while I did those things, I don't believe that it's necessary, but uh, I'm only speaking about Shore Nru or the White Crane. The White Crane depends on hitting the nerve and doing it quickly. But if you ask Sensei Suino, he might have a different question because he is handling bigger men maybe and, and trying to move their bodies or his body into a certain position so he can throw them. I'll leave that up to him. Um, just before we move on from you, Hanchi, and what, were there people back in the day in the 60s and 70s that you knew of who were adding weights? You know, to be honest, when I think about it, not very many, very few. We just did a lot of repetitions and uh, did two-man exercises where you would move the other person. Even though it, back in the day, by the day, I mean, Matsumura's day, they still had rocks and stuff that they lifted and so yeah. it's not necessary, Sensei. but it's, it's definitely helps. Yeah. Sensei, I just was going to say, I remember you talking to me about, I don't want to say the name of the individual, but where you wore wrist and ankle weights all the time. And on the day that you had to fight him, you dropped them off like at the edge of the ring. And they were like, Oh crap. That was like one of the things, maybe it was just a psychological ploy, but the other thing that I remember you talking about is how oftentimes Benny Allen would make you guys do like thousands of push-ups and leg raises and stretching and calisthenics. And that was like the first hour before you started doing your techniques. So not strength, but definitely extra things. Work. Yes. Extra work. Yeah, he would have a three hour class. The opening exercise would be one hour. So and in those days, the dojos were almost bare. You just had a couple of weapons. And, but nowadays, you're putting out an, uh, a super martial artist. Yeah. You once said something to me, Sensei, when I was down in Hanji Legacy, when I was down in uh, Los Angeles, and I was talking about weight training because I was working at a gym at the time. And you said, do your karate after your weights. And I love that because I'd always use the karate as a way to get my kata going, get my sweat going. But when I flipped it, the karate got harder. And then when I do karate without doing weights before, it was easier, almost like your wrist and ankle weights. Mm -hmm. It was helpful. What are your thoughts, Sensei Suino, on this question? Yeah, I, uh, 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 two thoughts. I mean, following up on what, what Hanshi said, clearly there's a, there's a super athlete now in the world that probably there wasn't 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, we just know so much more. There's so much science. And we have this huge testing ground, right, which is – which is the UFC and it's, it's offshoots. Um, but for me, there's two. So as I age, one of the things I, I train for is to try to extend the life of my joints, try to extend my cardio um, and, and all that. But the other thing I've noticed is that there's also an inherent conflict. Just like you said, Sean, uh, if you lift weights and you get tight, it, your karate is not as good, right? You have to work through that. It helps you, but you gotta, you gotta work through that. Um, and when I started lifting weights, it was during the early days of sort of Arnold Schwarzenegger's fame. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to do karate and judo and trying to make big, pretty muscles like Arnold had. 
Arnold had. And those things I don't think are that compatible. I think those muscles are in the way. Uh, but nowadays we have this um, multi-purpose training for agility, for flexibility. You know, there's a lot of kettlebell stuff that moves, makes the, the whole complex of muscles strong instead of making one big. Right. Um, and I think that's a lot more effective because building the wrong kind of muscles can actually interfere with you. You, you want to be strong. You want to be flexible. You want to be fast. Um, you don't want to be tight. You don't want such bulky muscles that they're in the way of your movement for being a martial artist. And if you look back at some of the early guys, the Frank Shamrocks, um, um, I mean, Dan Severn was a great martial artist, but I think he was just a little too big for himself. Um, you look back at a lot of the early MMA guys that had big muscles. They didn't do well. They got gassed early, mm. right? Uh, they didn't move well. They didn't have a lot of agility. And they were fighting guys like the Gracies who just were, were skinny, <laughs> you know, yeah. no, 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 uh, no pretty muscles, but they knew how know. to fight. There was that early... Mark Coleman knockout where Pete Williams kicks him in the face and Mark Coleman just couldn't finish the fight. And he just kept doing this and Pete Williams stayed a little more regular. And he, he threw that really legendary kick that no one knows who Pete Williams is these days, but he had a good little run there for a sec. And his conditioning was way better than the, the Mark Coleman of that era. It was mm -hmm. an interesting time. Um, so would the top judo players today be doing a lot of weights? Well, they're incredible shape. But I think the kind of weights they're doing is they're not doing like, you know, uh, you know, they're not doing massively heavy bench press. Uh, you know, I used to do that stuff um, and it interfered with my martial arts. I think they're, they're much smarter. They're, they're, you know, if you watch, especially like the, um, oh my gosh, the, you know, the, the Turks, the Mongolians, um, some of the European countries, especially Eastern Europe. Those guys are incredibly fast and strong and dynamic, but when they take their judo tops off, they just look, they're beautiful. I mean, they're, the guys are so fit. It's incredible. Um, but they figured out the balance, right? They know how to move well. They know how to stay flexible, keep their joints healthy and still be stronger than hell. I thought you were going to go the other way. I thought you were going to say they look like Fedor. And cause he's another interesting example of a guy who looked like, well, I can take this guy. Like, <laughs> yeah, but how? Well, you know, some people the the, the Eastern European body, right? You, that, right. That's a struggle. But but there are you. It's a real mistake to judge people by how yeah how they look, right? It's a huge mistake. Yeah. Um, Sensei Dolphin, I know you'll have some ideas on this for sure. Well, I have a lot of ideas on it because I still do lift heavy weights. Um, oftentimes, people think I'm a lot heavier than I actually am because just of maintaining low body fat and having more muscle mass. Uh, but I, the students in here, I think, I wanna say, I agree with what Sensei Legacy said, you don't have to be strong. Like it, it's really irrelevant to me what your one rep max bench press squat deadlift is. It's not gonna help you when you get on this floor and you haven't trained for 30 years. Like you're, I, I really don't care. Like I know, I know Alden can bench press more than me and squat more than me and deadlift more than me, but I feel pretty comfortable coming in here and doing martial arts with him and fighting with him. Like I, I feel okay with that. Um, but having said that, I do like to lift heavy weights. I just like to be smart about it. Right. So I like mm. to do five by fives. Um, you know, if I'm doing heavy squats, I don't like to do like crazy number of repetitions. Like I like to just lift it like a five by five. So squats, heavyweight, 80% of max, five reps, five sets. Bench, same thing. Deadlift, same thing. Bent row, same thing. Overhead press, same thing. I don't know that I need that for my martial arts. I just like it. Like it just makes me feel good. So that's why I like to do it. But uh, with the students, I often say you should always be assessing what is your cardio, what is your muscular endurance, and what is your flexibility? Those are three key things for me, for every martial artist. And I don't think it matters if you do karate, Iaido, judo, MMA, whatever it is your style is, you want to be flexible, you want to have muscular endurance, and you want to have good cardio, like period. And if you have those things and somebody doesn't have one of them, you're probably going to find yourself in a better situation when you're across, across the mat from them. If you're a judo player and the person has better endurance than you or the same endurance and same cardio, but you're more flexible, the person who's more flexible is 
they're probably going to beat you. Like we're just talking physics, right? Like not your brain and your training. So that's what I think. And real quick, Sensei, because I'm, I'm, you know, I, I love that idea and you've talked about it in class over 20 plus years with me. Um, but you've used the word strength in the past and you're saying muscular endurance, which I love, by the way. Can you, can you talk about the difference? Yeah, I think like, you know, the difference is, can you move something one time? Or can you move it 500 times? Yeah. Right. Like what's the, and if you think about that, how many times can you lift your leg to do a kick? Right. How many times can you move your arms to do a punch with good technique and good, good timing and good speed? Well, that's muscular endurance for me. Right. Yeah. Thanks. And I think your, your speed often comes from flexibility. Right. And I, as you, I know for myself, as I've traversed through, like flexibility is something that I'm really more focused on these days as a 50 year old person. Like I say, I like to lift heavy weights, but I'd prefer to be able to do the splits. <laughs> right? <Like> that's. <laughs> yeah. um, all for me, it's real simple. It, it comes down to time management. Like th- I've had periods in my life, especially when I joined karate where I was lifting weights five days a week. And I was doing karate less than that as I was entering into the world of being a serious martial artist. I always found it conflicted. I always found I was tight. Um, and in a way that didn't help my martial arts for me, I hadn't, um, you know, the idea of muscular endurance hadn't become a part of my thinking. I was lifting. I literally have the Arnold encyclopedia and I was trying to lift like a bodybuilder and, and it never quite worked for me. And you know this, cause we've talked about it. Like, I feel like I've unlocked what for me is working beautifully, which is karate first, jujitsu second, mountain biking third, and the lateral moves of the mountain bike versus the road biking I used to do, hitting jumps, pulling up on the wheels, punching, et cetera. Um, it doesn't put me in that linear tight hips, tight IT band kind of thing. It's very much like a sparring session. Um, I've never once sparred with Sensei Dofan and thought, ah, oh, the reason I got hit is because I'm not strong enough. <laughs> or the reason I couldn't hurt him is because I'm, I'm not like it's never once it, it's a joke to me it's it's timing it's strategy it's um, you know he's he said to me real early on like you have all the power you're going to need um, and if anything it's trying to deliver too much power that slows me down and puts me in a bad position so and, and by the way it goes the same sensei Sweeno can definitely attest to this like I'm never grappling going if only I was stronger I could get out of this it's, oh, I don't know the technique to get out of this. And when I learn the technique, it never is about strength. Framing, yes. Strength, no. So for me, if I had a fourth, if I had time in the world for fourth, it would definitely be weights. Uh, but it would be what they're talking about, functional fitness, not max bench press. Love that question. Love your answer, Sensei. Thanks. Thank you. Alden, are you good, Alden? Oh, yeah. Really good. Yeah. And just if anybody's wondering about Alden, he's got good muscular endurance. He's very <laughs> flexible. <laughs> and good cardio. And he, if you're on this call, he can lift more weights than you. <laughs> like, <Yeah. everyone. laughs> well, right, tell, him to go, tell him to shut off his video then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to throw one last thing before Alden goes, you know, just as a good omen tomorrow night, he and I are going to go look at some indoor space uh, at a studio. It's not a done deal. So I don't want to talk too much about it, but uh, the Toronto club after having lost our gym space through our COVID dear friend, Jim owner, losing his training outdoors for a year and a half come rain, shine or two feet of snow. We're trying to find that nice floor surface and it looks like we might've found one. So uh, we'll report back maybe next week or on the next host chat, but you know, everybody on this call who teaches knows what it's like to be looking for a space and the excitement of maybe having found one. So I just want to put that out there as a good omen for everybody listening because you're also supportive that throw us your good wishes around 7 p.m. tomorrow night that <laughs> what we're looking at is good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, awesome. Alden. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Benz, I don't know if there's other questions, but before you were on a vacation too, and before we get too far, I know you probably had a fairly unique experience uh, with Jean-Jacques Machado 
about and I'd love yeah. to hear about that, your thoughts on that. Yeah, great. I'd love to share, you know, um, the, the first thing I want to talk about, and, and I messaged you this was, you know, I trained there almost daily for six months when I was living in LA two and a half years ago. And uh, I wrote them a couple of weeks ago when I knew I was going to go from the movie to, over to LA. And I was like, are you guys doing guests right now? And uh, the first line of the message back is, no, 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 there's no guests like during COVID at all. And then there's two spaces and it says, but what are you talking about? You're not a guest, your family can't wait to see you. And as a guy who's not always sure he's on the inside, obviously with everyone in this call, I feel that way, but it was just beautiful. You know, it was nice to know that we have these, cause we're all family, but that time you put in on the mats with people, they get it. And, you know, I thought it was maybe just special to me, but when I got into the club and everybody's like, ah, nice to see you, like people like, we picked up rolling like we hadn't ever been away. And, you know, it's a very serious club. It's a world-class club. And so most of those people found a way to roll during COVID the way many of us allegedly found to keep training with each other during COVID. Um, you know, the first thing I want to say is just training pays off. Like the people who hadn't trained, I could get the better of, even if they used to get the better of me. And the people who kept training, we literally just did this together. Like just some incredible stuff. And, I probably did 70 rolls and you know, the way he tends to do classes, you drill for half hour and then you go into rolling. Um, the big thing for me though, and, and this is what I'd like to talk about and it really feeds into what we just talked about is, you know, Jean-Jacques teaches and rolls like a lot of the time. And so I was like, Hey coach, you, you want to roll with the blue belt? And he's like, yeah, man, nice to see you. And there's good. And then there's, again, I put all of you in this category. It's just different it's, there's no effort. Like it's the technique aspect, right? Like Sensei Dolphin, if I think of the last time we fought, like, I'm just like, how is he there and his hand there? Like, I don't know how that happened like that. And I'm not trying to blow you up in relation to Jean-Jacques, but I would just be like, oh, this, I'm just in his hooks right now with his arm around. And the, the word I wrote down when we started chatting is just ease, just the ease of someone who knows the technique versus somebody who can put you there muscularly. Um, when I posted that I felt humbled, it was genuine. Like in terms of being in the right place, like my rank is bang on, the guys who used to beat me, some of them couldn't, some of the guys ahead of me couldn't, some of them behind me were right on my heels. But then you go roll with someone who's just a true master, a coral belt that, you know, Hicks and Gracie gave him. And it was like, where the, how the fuck is this happening right now? And the, the humility that made me go back and train my next four classes harder. So I don't know if there's any more to it than that, but there's a real difference between someone who's a good workman and someone who's a true master. And when you're, when you got that true master's hands on you, it's, it's a delight. And it, I really did feel like a wipeout, like not in a false humility sense, but in a, I don't know what I'm doing out here. I love that, Sean. Um, and I love hearing all that, but what I really want to know is, how many times did he submit you and how did he submit you? I oh. want to know, like, you know did, he, did he triangle choke you? Did he rear naked choke you? Did he arm bar you? Did, like what happened there? The arm bar and the triangle, like the, the, that club has an incredible close guard game. Um, if ever I was going to, I'm a blue belt. If ever I was going to get the better of a purple or, or befuddle them, it's if they were trying to pass and I could get in on their legs through like a De La Hiva or a deep, uh, a reverse X or an X. You're not going to get that on Jean-Jacques. So the next thing you know, you're in his guard and then he's just separating your arms from each other. And he's literally doing it and he's going, hey, Julie, you going home today? Okay, we see you tomorrow. And you're just buried going, and he's like, and then he just kind of looks, goes, come on, man, you got this. And then you're just like, okay, but he's not being a dick. Like he's not making fun. He's giving you this much space if you know what to do with it. And then he's like, oh, shit, man, you went the wrong way. And then just tightens. And you're just like, you know, I think I can stay without the room doing that, doing that, doing that, um, which, again, goes to the ease. But because of that close guard game, and since Sweeney, you know what I'm talking about, the triangle and the arm bar are just fucking bread and butter. And it's just that flip around. You think you're going to take someone's back. And then next thing you know, he's got yours. And you're like, God, I walked right into that. So, yeah, those... But, you know, he's given a lot of chances, just the way when we're fighting, right? You're letting me find ways to hit you. He's letting me find ways to pass if I can find it. But if not, you're going to end up pretty fast. 
I like Sean that you're you could actually recognize that. Mm. It was a really good moment for me when I was fighting with Sense of Legacy. I, I remember a couple of times, I'm not gonna get into the specifics, but I remember like doing something and then I looking at him and going, you let me do that, right? Nah. And I remember him <laughs> once saying to me, looking right at me and going, you figured out when I'm letting you do something, mm. right? So it's pretty cool that you know that Machado was like, maybe he was telling you, but regardless that you knew like, okay, I'm getting something or I'm figuring something out, but he's putting it in front of me so that I, I can do it. that. You know, the one thing, and again, everyone on this call knows this because you've all been a master in one art and then started over in another, you know, um, or, or whatever with, with the sword or the white crane or whatever. And uh, it's really kind of awesome to have one thing over here and then one thing over here, I find. Because to be this, like have, I'm teaching class out in the park, they do what I ask them or tell them to do. And then over here, and the one thing I would say to all the higher belts, and this is how I phrase the Sensei Dauphin is, at the end of the role, I'd say thanks for the opportunities. Because everybody who was purple or higher gave me a chance to do something that then they could defend from or play from. And I think that's it, is recognizing that I was given nothing but opportunities. It's not like thanks for giving me a chance to choke you. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, a pathway that you then shut down very quickly. <laughs> and then next time I get to go this much further in the video game of it. What's he like as a person, Sean, as far as you're going to go out and have uh, sushi with him, what's he going to be like across the table? So present, chill, kind, um, big voice, but not a big personality, if that makes sense. Like, Hey, Sean, mister, how you doing? And then just kind of like, Hey man, what's going on? Like, you doing well? You're shooting a lot. Like how is Canada? Like just easy present. And again, just like everyone in this call, like I was kind of shocked to realize if he's not just coming back from a seminar in Australia, he's teaching every class. Like that's what he does. Comes in, shows the drills, does the drills, rolls with people. You ask a question. He goes, come here. What do you like? If you ask a question, he goes, no, no, no. Come on and show me. What do you, what do you, what's the problem? Oh, no, no. You get the arm like this and go like this. And you're like, oh, Good luck trying that 12 minutes later in the role, but there's no theory, right? It's like, let's get hands on and do this. And that for me is why I say big voice, hey, mister. Like he knows it's Jean-Jacques Machado, but I don't get ego, you know? I don't get ego. He really wants his students to thrive. And, you know, he's really, really, really proud of his students. Like there was a small tournament, and, you know, one guy who was a relatively new blue belt got like second or third. He like made a big point of making sure the class knew. And you know, the sensei Suino that the, the gradings in jujitsu are like someone just walks out and goes, okay, today we're going to give him a blue belt. Um, and, but then he'll, he'll give it more of the kind of ceremony we are about the student, not about himself or the school. It's like lovely. There's a reason when I was there for the six months, I started there for two months in one spot near him. And then I moved almost an hour away from where his club was. And I could have gone to Cobrino, which is a legendary club down there. I could have gone down to Eddie Bravo, who, you know, but Eddie Bravo learned everything he knows from Machado. So I was like, you know what? I'm here for four more months. I'm going to make the drive now because I've connected. And I'm really glad I made that choice, which I learned through loyalty with, with what we all have. So, yeah. It's, uh, you, you'll enjoy meeting him when, when we're down there at the same time. And however that goes. So, you know, you you once, uh, you once trained with uh, Hoist Gracie. How is, how does what Sean's talking about compare to when you trained with him? Really similar. Um, just a consummate master of what he did. A real gentleman, a very systematic teacher. Uh, clearly, well, this, you know, this ties right into what we started talking about tonight about humility versus, you know, how much humility or false humility. You know, um, just super genuine, nice human being, clearly incredibly confident, right? He had, he had done all you can do in the martial arts world. One of the most influential people in the 20th century. Um, uh, but just super genuine guy, very kind and, and very knowledgeable. Um, I wanted to touch base a little bit on what you said, Sean, about giving opportunities um, anybody who's a martial artist, if you have not listened to the podcast, the Joe Rogan podcast with John Danaher, 
you need to get your ass on YouTube and listen to that. It's worth every single minute of the three hours that those guys talk. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, am I thinking of the Lex Friedman one? It's the Lex Friedman interview with John Danaher. Uh, and they go down this wonderful road talking about the history of judo and jujitsu and how they come together. And, you know, uh, uh, and Danaher's talking, you know, like a physicist, uh, but so normal people can understand it. <laughs> um, but during the course of that interview, they're talking about Ryan Gordon, right. Who's sort of the top, the top jujitsu guy mm -hmm. in the world, top competitive judo jujitsu guy in the world right now. And Danaher was talking about how people come into their dojo and they roll with Ryan Gordon and they submit him, and they go away feeling super proud. I just submitted Ryan Gordon and he's, and Danaher's like, you guys have no idea. You know, he's learning, he's studying, he's giving you opportunities, right? That's not John Danaher. That's not Ryan Gordon in competition. Right. Yeah. And I think all great martial artists do that. We give opportunities to help teach and we give opportunities so we can learn ourselves. Right. If you were always fighting full out, I don't think that much learning would take place at a certain point. I love that. Where's, where's the joy. Right. And so I'm either teaching or I'm learning. And once in a great while, I mean, I'm not tooting my own horn, but I've been at this a while. Once in a great while, when you light somebody up, they just, their eyes open. They go, holy shit. I didn't realize that was possible. Right. So, well, you've been training here for five years and I've never had occasion to, you know, to, to turn that on because I'm always teaching or learning. Right. Well, I'm still sitting in our own, like almost my own thought to Alden, like, it really, I can't think of a time where the answer to any of my martial arts questions wasn't technical. Like, if Sensei Dofan, if I'm asking you something, it's not go run another lap. It's turn this way or come this way, or you got to get your wrist turned over for this. And it just, it never ceases to amaze me that, you know, because there's so much McDojo stuff out there that isn't real, but then there's so much technique that is real. And there's no end, I think, to how, you know, you, you, there's not necessarily new striking moves, but there's new striking positions or, or patterns or pathways based on who you're fighting. Sense of legacy, do you remember how many reverse punches you had to throw before the first one you landed in a fight was like, oh my God, that was like butter? I, no, I don't. But it was a lot, right? It was a lot of <laughs> punching the air. I always tell a new student, this is what I say to them. You have to throw a million punches. You might as well get started right now. I love it. That's what I tell white belts. It's, so, and the other thing I like to say about, about learning is it's, it's always usually about the basics of the art. When you make a mistake, it'll be found there. And if you train your basics a lot, like everyone does, I know I was at Sensei Suino's class for a long time doing EI, we always open with the exercises. And that's what really builds your reflexes. It's not um, some far out idea. It's basic, simple, it's right there, can be done. You just need a sensei to point it out. And that's what I guess uh, your friend allows you to do. He creates that for you so that you can rediscover it. If you, you don't, somebody can tell you about karate all your life, but if you don't go in there and discover it for yourself for the first time, you're gonna be a shabby martial artist. It takes a lot of time to train your brain. It has a lot to get trained. I have a question ostensibly for Hanchi Legacy and, and, and Sensei Dofan, a striking question that I'm curious in as we, unless there's anything else we're gonna miss out on if we get into this. Um, just, you know, whenever I work with boxers or watch boxers, you know, even with the Jake Paul, Tyron Woodley, whatever, it brings attention to something I haven't watched a lot of. But I've got a friend I box with, and we'll, we'll box on his terms, is they use so much more head movement than we use, especially in between, right? Because there's a more relaxed, stiller approach to how we'll start. 
and they're doing a lot of this stuff. And I'm wondering your thoughts on head movement, head movement in between, like when you're not just slipping something versus our, our more still kickbox style. Well, the box, boxers have the best hand techniques in the world to start with. And second of all, they're standing two feet away in order to hit you. And they're using only their hands. So you have to come up with right. something else to get the hell out of the way. <laughs> but in karate, you can be the best boxer in the world. If I take your legs out, it's going to be tough for you to hit me. So yeah. it's, it's a different, it's different, but no lesser. Yeah. Then I hear that. Arts, uh, martial arts. Like I said, boxers, in my opinion, uh, have the upper body trained really well to react and attack and counter punch. And so uh, that's necessary if you're boxing somebody. But if you see it, uh, you say, uh, what's the Irish guy's name, the MMA guy? Connor McGregor. I really like Connor McGregor, for instance. He was, he had to fight a boxer, right? But the boxer wouldn't let him do his MMA stuff. It's too dangerous. It's, one is a sport, one is a killing art. Not that a boxer could not kill you with a punch. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's what I'm saying. You got to. You can't just stand there, just against the hands. You have to discover different ways of. Avoiding square on. Thanks, Anchi. I really appreciate that. Uh, you want to add anything to that, Sensei Dauphin? Uh, I guess the only things I would add, Sean, is their karate is different than boxing. Um, and I bet if you were a karate person fighting a boxer, you'd find yourself moving your head a lot more. Right. Right. Because we're talking about like, I just feel like probably like in here when I fight or when I, when I was fighting with Sensei Legacy, unless your defense is super sound, you're not going to move in on a straight line at Sensei Legacy. Like you're not going to, right? Like unless your defense is like so sound that you're going to move and try and like get the person turning and then use your defense to try and set something up. Right. Probably. Yep. Like, I mean, I don't know where, where it all hits, where the rubber hits the road is when you're on the sidewalk, right? Yep. And I think when the rubber hits the road, when you're on the sidewalk, if you're a high level karate person, high level judo person, high level boxer, high level yado person, and you happen to have a katana strapped to your side, <laughs> um, you know, they're probably, when the conflict starts, there's not going to be a lot of head movement. There's going to be a lot of moving in and finishing it off pretty quick. Right. Um, so I just want to be clear. What we're talking about is in athletic sparring, um, yeah. not an yeah. actual real conflict. Yep. I love that. And I'm yeah. not saying head movement is good in real conflict too, right? Like, but hands up is better. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome. Any uh, any ideas around the conflict and head movement in relation to your your, your art, Sensei Suina? Any thoughts, or you want to leave it at that? You're called. Well, I really admire boxers for a lot of reasons: their fitness, their ability to move well, um, ability to to endure getting punched. Uh, and I think there's a lot of similarities between the way you move in judo and the way you move in boxing. I had a new student come in for intros the other day and he had done some boxing training and he kept telling me he thought he couldn't do the judo well because of his boxing, but I don't think that's the case. I just don't think he was wired for it. Um, that lightness on your feet, constantly moving your feet, uh, moving from the hips. It's all really, it's, 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 it's all useful stuff. Yeah. Everything we're talking about today keeps coming back to that idea that, you know, strength is helpful. Um, but it's not the determining factor, right? Love that. Um, anything, um, I know we're going to mention the Shi'i, but is there anything we want to talk about? We've got about two minutes to go, or should we just go around the horn and close her up? Well, we definitely want to talk about karate tournaments coming up, right? Yep. Like there's, I personally am very excited that karate tournaments are coming out again. Um, 
since Copeland's on this call, I can't wait to be at his tournament. I'm going to be there with bells on. I know since legacy is going to be there too. We're going to have competitors. We're going to help from the second he opens the door until the second he closes the door. I'm also super excited. You might as well mark your calendar now that the third weekend in February, we're going to have some type of a Matsumura challenge, mm. whether it's under the cloak of darkness or in a high school gymnasium. Um, we're going to have a karate tournament. Uh, so that's, that's definitely something that will be happening. Uh, and there's other tournaments as well. They've already started happening and I'm super happy and excited that they are. So that's definitely one thing that we want to mention before we go around the horn. Uh, before we go around the horn, I just want to be sure that since the is ready and excited to talk about the next two weeks, because he knows the guests much better than I do. And, uh, I don't feel like I'm the one who should be talking about it. So I think that's the announcement, unless I'm forgetting any announcements that. No, there's just, nothing else I had written down, just that we want to talk about the Shi'i and I'm so excited for that. So excited yeah. for that. And if you've never been to one before, if you're watching this on YouTube later, know that if you come to, I don't want, I can't mention all of them. Like the ones that, that I really like in the Ontario region are Sensei Copeland's and ours. You're going to get top notch competition. You're going to get super great refereeing. It's going to be organized and it's going to be fair, right? When you come to the Matsumura challenge, and I keep mentioning Sensei Copeland's, but his students aren't always the ones who win. Like many times somebody from Legacy Sharonru goes and wins. You can, the last time we had one, a person from Mexico won, Ryan Feist, Ryan Potter have run ours. I know Sean, you have won ours, but you know, it's because it's fair. Like we're not trying to promote right. Legacy Sharonru. Yeah. We're trying to promote classical martial arts and a celebration of martial arts through the action of martial arts. And so that's why I'm excited for karate competitions to be coming back. I love that. And we've all been at those tournaments where, you know, you sidekick someone and their sensei is the center ref and calls it a slip or whatever. Yeah, I can just reiterate, that's not this tournament. There's no senseis who are refing or judging. One thing I want to throw out, and I know you're going to appreciate the sensei, but you know, it's September already. Let's take our tournament the Matsumura challenge five months away. Well, if you want to be, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this to anyone on this call, if you want to be so much better at fighting this year than the last time there was a tournament, if you want to be so much better at your kata or your weapons, all three, now you've got a busy schedule. Start training tonight for that. Start training tomorrow. I mean, I know we're always training, but I'm literally thinking, okay, great. February's coming. How can I, walk away with some medals and the medals aren't necessarily the most important part, but the training to get them is. I can promise you one thing, Sean, too. win, lose or draw. When the tournament's done, you're going to be a better martial artist. Yep. And imagine if you trained your ass off for five months and then there was some weird wave and the tournament got canceled. You wouldn't have wasted a day of that training. That's right. You know? Um, and, you know, you did mention that I did one. I've only, I've only won that tournament once, but it was the one year I was willing to admit I wanted to, where I said, I'm going to win. I'm willing to lose to win. Um, because those other years, I'm like, yeah, I'm just here to compete. Fuck that. I want to win this year. Sean, I can tell you something. Our tournament, in my 33 years in karate, I can name the 15 people who've won it. Mm. And you're one of them. Right, like yeah. since the Copeland's won it a number of times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think you might as well. So I'd say I won it once or twice. Since the Seratins won it a bunch of yeah. times, we've had, you know, of late we had a competitor from Mexico, David Luis Munoz, who has won it. Um, again, Ryan Feist. Sorry, Sensei, what did you say? Doug Canispel. Doug Canispel has won it. You want to see a guy do a bow kata or an empty handed kata. That's the guy you want to watch. Yeah. Yep. And you know, just to throw out to the people watching, like I know some people who've won tournaments with one fight and that's valid. Some tournaments are like that, but you know, the last when David Munoz beat me, that was my fourth fight in the year that I did well, that was my fourth fight. Like the, the, the pools run deep. You broke up a bit there, Sean. 
Yeah, you're choppy. Oh, okay. It must be me. I was just saying how the pools run deep. Like there's some tournaments where you can win on one fight or get it gold on two. But the last two times I've been in our tournament, it was four rounds of fighting. Yeah. I see solid. Sensei Maletsky keeps raising his hand or not. Like Sensei Maletsky, if you have a question or a comment, like write something in the chat. If you want us to turn your camera on, we'll extend for a couple minutes to talk to you. If One thing that came up here from, uh, from Andre is that he just wanted to mention the October seminar for the Yellow Brick House, October 17th, 2021. Right. And that's the one you two are going to be teaching at, yeah? Yes. Awesome. And then we did get a message from Chris Quatt, who did have to leave, and he just said, thanks for the visit to Vancouver. He did have to leave to teach his class, but uh, he just wanted to extend his thanks. I wonder how he's teaching that class on his crutches with his, <laughs> with his cast on his foot. <laughs> well, I think we're at round the horn time, yeah? Yeah. And then we'll come back to Sensei Suino for our next two weeks. Hanchi Legacy, anything you want to chat about to say goodnight from our talk this week? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. uh, everything went pretty smooth. It's great to do these things just to throw some stuff around. We need a little more participation maybe with the questions so uh, it can make these a bit more um, successful as far as getting the information out that um, the audience or the people out there would like to to know or understand because we all you know we have a fair amount of teaching under our belts and we can always help sometimes and you know not so much do you not believe your sensei but a little bit more when somebody says the same thing in a different way mm. and it it makes you and enlightens you how smart your sensei really is but you're not just getting, you're just not getting it. You just need to learn something in, in a different way. Thanks, It's Hachi. a good place to do it. Yeah. Sensei Suino? Yeah, why don't you just loop back to me and I'll, I'll talk, I'll tee up next, next week's episode. I've had a great, a lot of opportunity to talk tonight. Yeah, right on. Sensei Dove? I just, I don't know. Like I said, it's, it is good to have lots of people. I'm, Super grateful that the people keep logging in, our regular people keep logging in and listening to us. I would like them to feel confident to turn their camera on and ask a question. That would be awesome. There's no reason not to. Um, mostly because I think some of them have stuff to teach us. Like there's yeah. a, when I look at the list of people like that might ask a question, I would be interested to hear what their own answer to the question would be. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's irrespective of rank. Right. Like I don't, I see people on the call right now who are like, you know, eighth and ninth ends. And I see people on the call who are white belts. The white belts should feel just as confident about turning their camera on and asking a question technical or not. I think it's good if they do, it would be great if they wanted to. Uh, super. I've been away with Sensei Legacy, had an awesome vacation, a uh, little bit of, I was talking to him today. I said a little bit of separation anxiety, right? Like you spend all this time together every day, all the time. And then you come home. I've been experiencing a little bit of separation anxiety. So it's good to see Sense Legacy tonight. Ben's awesome to see you. I'm happy you have a great vacation. I don't want to rank things. I'm super excited to talk to Sense of Sweeno tonight. This might be through the pandemic. This last three weeks is the longest we've gone without seeing or talking to each other. And I personally have missed seeing Sensei Suino and talking to him. And so tonight was great just to, I don't want to sound like a fanboy, but just to be able to look at him and hear his thoughts on things. <laughs> I, was, I was happy to, uh, to do that. Um, yeah, I, if there's something that's standing out in my mind, it happened just since Legacy said, you're going to have to throw a million punches. You might as well get started right yeah. now. <laughs> like, I like that. That's probably true of every single thing that you need to do in life. So I'm happy we're back. Two weeks is too long. Let's not do two weeks break again. Uh, amen to that.
Amen to that. Um, before I throw it to Sensei Suino, yeah, the, the one thing that stuck out for me is that that phrase about humility. I love that, Sensei Suino. I'm going to use that. And, you know, um, I always appreciate the chance to chat a little bit more. I always feel a little nervous, more so than when I'm on a set or on a stage because, you know, I really respect my teachers. And, uh, and when I open my mouth with my own opinions, it's sometimes harder than hosting. But the one thing, you know, I appreciated the compliments about the teaching. And I just did want to say with no false humility, I've only ever tried to do what I was taught. Like one of our little traditions is when you get your black belt, you teach the next class back for the most part. And it's like, oh yeah, what did sensei do last week in class that I can try and, you know, follow the model of. So I just love that we're part of a lineage that can, uh, when in doubt, replicate what was given to me. Um, sensei Sweeno, take us home. We have some great upcoming guests. I'm happy to say that September is judo month at Punch, Kick, Joke, and Chat. Next week, we have Sensei Al Panakia on. Um, and I am really looking forward to that because I've known Al for several years, uh, mostly because he's just so selfless. He comes to so many events that we do at JMAC. He's so active in the Midwest, Midwestern judo scene. Um, uh, but what I don't know a lot of is I don't know a lot of his history. I know hints and echoes of what he's done. He's a, he's a very important uh, uh, American judo player, and I want to know more about that. So I'm really looking mm. forward to next week to talking to Al. And it's probably fair to say he's one of our most avid viewers here at Punch, Kick, Choke, and Chat as well. So it just many things are going to come together next week, and that's going to be amazing. I can't wait. Uh, and then in two weeks, if I have my calendar right, we're going to have Sensei Francis Glaze on the show, who's also uh, an extremely accomplished, I, I call them judo players. It's not the traditional way to describe judo coaches. Uh, Sensei Glaze is one of the most uh, important female uh, judo representatives in the Midwest, perhaps in all of North America. She's very highly ranked. She's very involved in coaching. She's very involved in association affairs but also just a phenomenal coach of judo kata um, and a really nice person. And again, somebody I don't know well, but I've been, been very privileged to spend time with her and very, very privileged to have her come to JMAC and teach. Uh, and so I'm just, it, this is a chance for me to get to know uh, both of these folks better and for the world to get to know them better as well. So uh, yeah, next week, Al Panakia, two weeks, Francis Glaze Sensei, rock and roll. Amazing. And lastly, you know, Andre Sedeshev was behind the camera tonight. And uh, thanks to all the other people who helped make Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat happen, including Robert Schlumsky, Mike Russell, Victoria Feff, Justin Shea, Alden Adair. And also there's a lot of people who just chip in along the way uh, whose names don't make the big list. But we're really grateful every time you add a pebble to the wall that gets mortared up into this thing we're doing. So thanks, everybody. Uh, what a treat to be back. We'll see you in a week and stay safe. Special hello to Warriors of Light. Yes. <laughs>